Okay, back again with another GCN Tech Clinic, helping you keep your bike running smoother for longer and hopefully for faster too. But with no further ado, let's crack on. Right, first up, Thomas says, do any pros cut their seat posts so that they just have the minimum inside of the frame to save weight? Uh, right, Thomas, to be honest with you, mate, very, very unlikely. Uh, most pros, they tend to actually ride a really, really, really standard setup with very little adjustment from the norm. Uh, the only case where it could be done, if it's quite a large rider and they want to have a lighter bike for the mountains, uh, but no, I can't think they would do it. And actually, in a lot of cases, pros actually have to use heavier components than they would like to, to meet that minimum weight limit of 6.8 kilos. Next up, Ollie Cook wants to know, why do track cyclists have their stems pointing up? It's a nice question, that one, Ollie. Um, now, in the last 10 or 15 years or so, track bikes have changed from what were really the last traditional looking bikes that we, that we were seeing. These days they use a very small compact frame, a smaller triangle. Could it be Team GB's UK Sports Institute bikes that really changed the way there? I don't know. However, one of the reasons can be is that it's a smaller triangle, so therefore it's stiffer, it's more aerodynamic, but in doing so means that you've got a smaller head tube too. So to get your same position, you're gonna to have to have a stem pointing upwards to get your handlebars in the right place. That's more than likely the reason for having those slightly ugly looking stems that point up. Now Liam wants to know, they've got themselves a black and red giant TCR and they're wondering what are the rules for handlebar tape color? Uh, it's currently black, but they find black just too boring. Well, the rules are express yourself in all honesty. So if you wanna have the most outrageous bar tape in the world, go for it. You know, it's your bike, isn't it? Personally, I tend to either just stick black or white and actually match it with the saddle. So it's up to you. Send a picture of your bike in there to the Bike Vault and we can let you know what we think of it. Go on, do it. Now, Barry Prescott has got a question. They want to swap to a different new Ultegra cassette for a trip to the Alps. Should they put on a new chain at the same time? Their existing chain has done about 1,000K. Right then, Barry, off to the Alps, are you? Lucky bloke. Anyway, uh, you should be absolutely fine to put that cassette on with the existing chain that's on there, providing, of course, that you've been degreasing it and lubricating it and taking good care of it. Now, if you are putting a different size cassette on the rear, so if you're going from a 25 to a 28 or something like that, just bear in mind that your chain may not be long enough to accommodate those extra teeth at the rear. As for the actual uh, compatibility, it will be fine, I think. I mean, I've used chains that are 2,000 kilometers old and put a brand new cassette on it and vice versa, and it's indexed fine. So you should be good to go there, but just bear in mind the length of that chain. So now David Chapman wants to know, uh, they're using Xalith brake pads with the Xalith wheels. Can they use these pads with any other non-Xalith braking surface wheels? So just to explain, Exalith is basically a coating on the rim surface of some of Mavic's wheels. Now, in order for that Exalith surface to really benefit, you're gonna use a special brake pad. Reason being, that Exalith coating is mega tough and mega hard wearing. So, no, do not use those brake pads with any other rims because you're not gonna get best braking practice. Right, now Steve Norris wants to know, uh, they're currently running an 1125 cassette and they want to put an 1128 on for a trip to the Yorkshire Dales. That's in the north of England, and it's pretty hilly by the way. Uh, will the current chain be okay and will they need to adjust the rear derailleur limit screws? Now Steve, that's quite hard to say I'm afraid without actually seeing your bike. Uh, the best thing to do is to put that new cassette on and see if the chain is long enough to be able to accommodate those extra three teeth on that new sprocket cluster. Worst case scenario, you're gonna need to get yourself a new chain as well. Best case scenario, you're not. As for adjusting the rear derailleur limit screws, no, you are not going to need to adjust them because it's a simple replacement. One thing you may need to look at though is the B-tension screw. So you may need to give it a turn or half a turn or a turn and a half just to actually move your upper pulley wheel on the rear derailleur away from the 28 sprocket so that it works better and gives you crisper shifting. Good luck in the Yorkshire Dales. Right, one now from Radfaden Abentur. I think that's how you say it anyway. Uh, if one of my tires is a 28 c and the other is a 25 c is it better to have the bigger tire on the front or the rear? Personally, put it on the rear, give your backside a little bit of extra comfort. Go on, do it. Now, Ronnie Erickson wants to know, uh, basically, 
he needs to replace his chain on his bike. He's got an 11 speed drivetrain, but there's lots to choose from. They're a year round commuter and go for long rides once or twice a week. Right, Ronnie, great question. And from my experimenting, all 11 speed chains work on all 11 speed group sets. And I'm sure someone out there will say that they've done it and it hasn't worked, but for me personally, it has worked. Now, as for making a choice, I'm afraid that entirely depends on your budget. So have a look around, maybe read some reviews and see which one you think will work best for you. Now, John Gales wants to do a little bit of a hack or a bodge. So here we go. Uh, they wanna know what amount of cable pull does a Shimano 105 front shifter have? Because they're having trouble finding it on the internet. Yeah, I had exactly the same problem there too. Uh, they're planning on fitting a dropper post on their cyclocross or adventure bike, and it'd be nice if they could actuate it with the front shifter they don't use anymore. Do you know what? I am totally and utterly stumped with this. I've had a look around and I've tried to measure it, but I just couldn't find an accurate answer, I'm afraid. But the good news is you can in fact do it because Dan Lloyd, my colleague, did it himself. So. Yep, do it and actually send me in the pictures or maybe a video of exactly what you've done because I love a hack or a bodge. I think it's great. Great use of that redundant lever. Go for it. Right, now from Laurate. I hope that's how I say your name. Uh, Hi John, love the show. Wow, what can I say? Uh, now most road cyclists never run their tires at the manufacturer's recommended pressure of 100 to 120 PSI. How should they determine how much pressure to use without risking a pinch flat? Whoa can of worms here. Over to you, Si. I weigh 73 kilograms. And when I use a 23C wide tire, I put 95 PSI in my front wheel and 100 PSI in the back because there's a little bit more weight over there. Then for 25s, I use 80 and 85 PSI. And then for 28s, I run 60 and 65 PSI. As I mentioned earlier, if you are a little bit lighter, you will want to run less. So consider putting in about one PSI less for every one kilogram of body weight. And then if you're heavier, you want to do the opposite. And if you're working in bar, then that's probably about one bar per 25 kilograms of body weight that's different. So we've got two very, very similar questions here, both from Stuart and also Gucci, in that they've got some Shimano brake levers and the reach on them is a little bit too hard for their hands, so a little bit too far away, and what can they do to actually solve it? Well, the good news is, basically, what you need to do on your shifter, or your brake lever, is actually peel back the rubber hood, and then normally, inside of there, there is a little screw or an Allen key, which is just gonna turn clockwise, and by doing so, the lever will move inwards so you can reach it better. Now, once you've done that, actually check the brakes and make sure they're still working fine. There's no slack in the cable at all. If there is, simply undo your brake caliper bolt and pull it through and you'll be good to go again. Right, Calvin wants to know, would I recommend using several chains at the same time for one cassette? Ah, but they mean switching one every 200K to another chain so you use a less worn chain for longer. Uh, should also keep better shift performance on the long run. They were thinking about using three chains for one cassette. Right, Calvin, uh, it's not something I've done personally, no. Uh, the reason being, changing a split link or a joining pin every 200K, that's soon gonna cost actually a fair bit of cash um, because, yeah, I do tend to ride quite a few kilometers. Uh, and also you can't obviously reuse those bits according to the manufacturers. Uh, I do know people who've, who do rotate their chains, not as often though as 200K. Personally, my advice to you would be to actually just take care of your chain and cassette in the first place. So just clean it and lubricate it correctly and it should last just as long as rotating those chains. Now, Daniel has got himself a bit of a braking problem. Uh, they recently, after a rainy and dirty long century ride, the rear brake uh, became very rough and stiff. Didn't happen to the front brake though, it's still very smooth. They've tried disconnecting the cables to try and isolate what's wrong, but the cable seems fine. The levers without the cables connected seem fine too. So the brake cable housing seems fine. Now, poor braking is an absolute nightmare and I hate it, especially when it's gritty and rough, and it always seems to be the rear brake which suffers the most. Now you've tried everything that I would do, one last thing to also try is actually check the outer cables on the ends. So make sure they're totally flush and that where the inner cable exits, it's not getting caught on anything. And where it's being housed inside of your brake caliper or uh, lever, 
that the cable basically is not coming in at a funny angle at all because sometimes that can create extra friction which feels gritty or rough. Let me know how you get on with it though and we'll see if we can tackle this in any other way. But I've got a feeling it could well be the ends of your cables or ferrules you need to look at. Now, last question this week is from Hayden Sanders who wants to know, basically, can a degreaser from a local car store work on his carbon frame and drivetrain and will it cause any problems? Now, I actually use a very all-purpose degreaser from a local hardware store. I've never had any problems with my drivetrain or carbon frame suffering anything. So there we are, you should be good. But ultimately, ask the person behind the counter for their advice, because they're gonna know a lot more about how strong that degreaser is. I'm sure there are some very strong degreasers out there on the market that could damage your drivetrain and frame. I'm afraid I don't know which ones they are. Right, that is it, I'm afraid. Another GCN Tech Clinic done and dusted. But remember, if you've got a bike problem, leave it for me in the comment section down below. Also, maybe a friend of yours has got a bike problem, they can leave it down there or you can get it answered for them in there too. Now, also remember to like and share this video with your friends, give it a big thumbs up. And remember to check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com where we've got t-shirts, hoodies, workshop aprons, socks, jerseys, shorts, you name it, we've got it. We're gonna cover you casually and on the bike as well, keeping you looking good. Now for another great video, click just down here for the latest Maintenance Monday.